Welcome, everybody. My name is Lars Schneider, and I'm the technical lead for GitHub Solutions at Autodesk. Right now, we are migrating hundreds of projects with millions of source code lines from Perforce to Git. And in this talk, I want to share the lessons we have learned so far. But first of all, who is Autodesk? Autodesk is best known for AutoCAD, a 2D and 3D computer edit design software. We are around for more than 30 years, and we have more than 4,000 engineers working on hundreds of projects. And these projects, they contain of terabytes of code and assets data. We are software in the architecture, engineering, and construction space. We have software in the manufacturing space, and we have software in the media and entertainment space. And if you have been to the cinema in the last 10 years, you have most certainly seen the results of this software. And more recently, we, are also, we also have hardware and software in the 3D printing space. Because we think 3D printing is the future of making things. So why do we migrate our source code to Git? Well, first and foremost, we want to standardize. As I said, we are around for 30 years, and we are growing every year. We are acquiring new companies with new products. And all these different products right now, they use different source control systems. And we use Perforce, Git, TFS, SVN, everything. And the biggest ones are really Perforce and Git right now. And we decided to go with Git and only with Git. That helps a lot, because we can, we can set up our um, continuous integrations more easily and our code review tools. Everything is very easy to set up if we have just one source control system. And if we, if we have all source in one system, then we enable on the en our engineers to discover source code more easily. And if they can discover source code, they can actually share and reuse this source code. And that's really what we want them to do. We don't want them to reinvent the wheel over and over again. If they share and reuse source code, then they collaborate. They fix each other's bugs across divisions, across projects, and across teams. And all these reasons together, they improve the quality of our source code. And consequently, they improve the quality of our products. And that's the most important thing for the business. So what will you learn today? First, I will show you how you migrate repositories from Perforce to Git using a tool called Git T4. I will show you how, you mig how to migrate history. I will show you how to handle file encodings. I will show you how to migrate branches. And most importantly, I will show you how to handle binary files. Unfortunately, most migrations are not that easy. Sometimes you need to restructure your repositories. And I will talk about this, too. And last but not least, I will talk about non-technical issues that we run into and that you probably will run into, too. But first, I will show you how to use Git P4. What is Git P4? It is a Python tool that comes with a Git distribution, and it helps you to migrate source code from Perforce to Git. It does all the heavy lifting for you. So how do you use it? First, you need to set up Perforce. You need to tell Perforce what user it should use, in my case, last year. You need to set up the Perforce server you are using with the P4 port variable. And then you log into P4. It's like that. Then we create a new directory and cd into this directory. And now it gets interesting. We invoke git p4 with a couple of parameters. The first one, clone. It tells git p4 to take the Perforce repository and move it to git. The second one is the base path of the Perforce repository that we want to migrate. And look at the suffix at all. That's super important here, because this suffix tells git p4 to move all history to git. That means all change lists in Perforce will become git commits. The third parameter just tells git before to store the, git, the resulting git repository right in that directory. And the last parameter, dash dash verbose, gives us some 
details what's going on when Git P4 is actually running. So this command will run quite a while, depending on the size of your repository, but eventually it will finish, and then your repository is on your local machine. So what you want to do then is you add a remote to push your um, repository up to GitHub, like that. And that's it. It's easy as that. Unfortunately, not all migrations are that easy. Sometimes you need to move around certain directories to make, um, yeah, to, in a, to generate the desired structure in your Git repository. How can you do that? Well, Perforce has a pretty powerful concept. It's called the client spec. And the client spec is a configuration of, or the client spec configura configures the local view of your Perforce repository. And as you can see here, there's a section view. And there you can shuffle around, uh, shuffle around directories and define where you want to have certain directories in your Git repository. But how do you use a client spec with Git before? Well, that's not too hard. At first, you need to load this client spec into Git P4, into P4. You need uh, to, to invoke this line, and you use the P4 client command uh, for that action. Then you go along with uh, making, the, uh, making the directory and cd into this directory, and then you do something different. You initialize your Git repository. Why do you do that? Well, Git P4 uses the config mechanism of Git for all its options. And here we tell Git P4 to use a client spec. That's the first thing you need to do. The second thing is you need to tell Git P4 what client spec you want to use. All client specs have a name. And here we call it project X spec. And then you run your migration as I just showed you one slide before, and it just works. Not quite, because at this point, I did run in my first, into the first pitfall. Let's consider this very simple Perforce repository. As you can see, there's one directory case, and it contains two files, A file and B file. So we use git before, we use a client spec, and we migrate the source code. And what we end up with is a repository that contains only one file. Well, that's weird, right? So I took a closer look at my Perforce repository. Can you spot it? Well, if you look at the path of the individual files, you will see that the path is the same, but it uses a different case. And at this point, I remembered, well, our Perforce server they run in case insensitive mode. That's quite useful if you have Windows clients. OK, so I thought I understood the problem, and I searched the git help files, and I found this interesting config, core ignore case. So I set it to true, and I thought, hmm, should solve the problem, right? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> it's still just one file in my resulting git repository. So. I decided to go a little bit deeper and debug actually Git P4. And um, guess what? I found a bug. And fortunately, I was uh, able to fix that bug. And oops. And now we have. Um, and now uh, when you. And now we can migrate the repository, and uh, both files will end up in your Git repository. This patch is already um, in, in the stable branch of Git, and it is part of Git 2.6, which was just released last week. And at this point, I really want to thank Luke Diamond, the maintainer of Git P4, who was really supportive and helped me to get this patch and other patches through. OK, the next pitfall I ran into was path encoding. If your Git repository looks like this after the migration, then you probably have non-ASCII characters in your path names. So what's going on there? Well, it turns out Perforce encodes path names with the encoding of the machine that makes the submission. That means if you use 
a Windows computer, a Western European Windows computer, your path names are encoded with CP1252 encoding. And Git expects UTF-8 encoding for all paths. And that's the reason why you end up with these weird characters. So I understood the problem, but what can we do about it? Um, Git before had no option to deal with this, so I actually added an option, path encoding, to Git before. And here you can define the encoding um, that you expect in your Pathos repository. And if you run your migration with this option, then your final repository in Git will look um, like that with the proper uh, non-ASCII characters. And again, this is part of, uh, of Git Next already, and um, it will hopefully be part of Git 2.7. Let's talk some more about encoding, but this time not about file path encoding. Instead, let's talk about encoding of the file content itself. Consider this text file. You take this text file and you migrate it from Perforce to Git, and you open it on Windows. It might look like that. So, what just happened? Well, as you probably know, Perforce um, supports automatic line ending conversions for UTF 16 and Unicode files. So, that means when you check out uh, a UTF 16 file on Windows, it will generate control line feed endings, and on Unix, it will generate line feed endings. Unfortunately, Git does not support UTF-16 files. Instead, it handles these files as binary files. And that means it will, all these binary files, they will contain the line ending as defined on the migration. And how do you define the line endings in a migration? Well, again, you use a client spec. And a client spec is a field that's called line end, and in this field, you can enter Win or Unix, and with this field, you can control what line endings you want to have in your UTF-16 and Unicode files that Git can understand. Okay. Speaking of UTF-16 files, there's another trap I run into. Perforce added UTF-16 support in 2007. And if your engineers used pre-2007 and past-2007 um, Perforce clients at the same time, or around that time, for the same files, they probably have um, corrupted a bunch of old revisions. And this is usually, this is no problem. You don't, um, you don't realize that because 2007 is long, long gone. Long gone. But we are migrating source code that has a history of more than 20 years. And so we run into these old revisions and we need actually to load, we need to load them in order to put them into Git. And if your file um, is damaged like that, then you won't be able to download it with the P4 command line client, you won't be able to download it with the P4 visual client, and of course, you won't be able to download it with Git P4. In all these clients, you will get this error, translation of file, encoded, uh, file content failed near line one. And just a little side note, so what does it mean? The problem is that, that uh, Perforce adds um, a byte order mark to UTF-16 files uh, in 2007, and pre-2007 files don't have that, and that's why the client crashes like that. Fortunately, I was uh, able to fix that, and um, implement a workaround in Git P4 to handle these cases properly. So all your data is properly migrated to Git. Unfortunately, because of some design decisions within Git P4, this patch is only applied when you pass the dash dash verbose option. I discussed that with the maintainers, and yeah, we, we agreed that this is probably the best option um, because we don't want to change too many things in Git P4 for this fix. And this fix is again scheduled for the next Git version. So I'm pretty excited about that. Okay. The next topic I want to talk about are branches. 
The implementation of branches in Perforce and in Git is completely different. In Perforce, a branch is more or less it's just a directory that you copy to and from files. In Git, all the branches are organized in a graph. And that makes the migration of branches pretty complicated. Git P4 actually has a branch import, but it did not work well for me. And that's why I implemented poor man's branch import, and I will show you what I mean by that. In the first step, I import Perforce branches, branch directories, as individual Git branches, as you can see here. I have a master branch that I've imported and a release branch that I've imported. And as you can see, both branches have no connection at all. That means if you would merge one of these branches, um, it wouldn't work because uh, Git can't find the common ancestor here. So in the next step, the second step, I create a copy of my branch, my release branch here. And I call this copy P4 history release. I will show you later on what we, why we need that. In a third step, I squash all the commits of the release branch into one commit, and I rename the branch squash the release. In a fourth step, I create a new release branch, but this time, I branch of master, so I have the connection between release and master. And then I move all the changes from the squash release branch to my newly created release branch. And here you can see we have our master branch and we have the content of our release branch connected to the master branch like that. And the development team, they can just continue with the development and work as they would work in Git. However, you might have spotted the problem here. Um, why, do we, why do we migrate history anyways? We want to learn from the history. And an engineer might look at a certain uh, source code line and to learn what, what, how the source code line was developed. And if he looks at the source code line in the release branch on the bottom of the screen, then chances are that he will end up in the X commit. And this commit doesn't tell him too much because it's, in the end, it's a lot of changes squashed together in one commit. However, I add a note into this commit that the developer should look into the P4 history release branch for more details. And that's what the engineer can actually do. He can switch to the P4 release branch and then look for the particular line that he's interested in. And then he will learn all the details about this line. That's not ideal, but at least it's a solution that works for our teams. Okay, and now I want to talk about large binary files. As you all know, Git was primarily designed for text files, and it does not handle binary files very well. How do you see that? Well, if you add a binary file to a Git repository and you change it a couple of times, your Git repository becomes very big very quickly. And that means your clone and fetch operation will take a very long time and it's no fun to use Git anymore. Many people realized that problem and came up with extensions to Git to, to solve the problem. So there are extensions that are called Git Annex, Git Fed, Git Media, and more recently, Git LFS. And Git LFS being the most interesting one from all these options, because as you learned just yesterday, Git LFS is natively supported by GitHub. And that's awesome, because it makes it very easy to set up Git repositories with LFS support. There's no special setup required, it just works. But how does Git LFS and most of the other options actually work? I will want to give you a little reminder of that. So in a Git repository, you have a Git attributes file. And in this Git attributes file, you define which files in your repository are large binary files, and, and uh, these are the files that you want to um, use LFS for. 
And instead of the large binaries, Git LFS stores just a pointer in the Git repositories, and this pointer points to a file server that actually contains the large binaries. That's pretty much how Git LFS works. And when you, when you clone a repository, and when you check out a branch, then Git LFS will automatically resolve these pointers and download the binary files um, and place them in your local working copy. So you don't even notice that something like that is happening behind the scenes. Okay, that's great. But how do you get actually these big binaries in the Perforce repository to Git LFS? Well, that's a two, for me, that was a two-step process. The first step was to change Git LFS a little bit. So I, added a, I created a pull request that actually enables Git LFS to push single files to the file server. And uh, yeah, luckily, <laughs> my, my pull request got merged. Uh, thanks to Rick from GitHub for that. Um, that was the first step. And the second step was to, um, yeah, I modified Git before in a way that it can handle large files differently. And I added a large file option. And as you can see here, you can set this large file system to Git LFS. And then Git P4 will use Git LFS for large files. But which files? Well, you can also define the extension of the files that you actually want to store in LFS. In this case, I want to store MP4 files in LFS. And then I tell Git P4 that it should actually push these files to the LFS server right away. That's more or less a debugging option. If you run the migration for the first time, you want to disable that so you, you actually see what files would end up in LFS. But here we want to do the real thing, so we set it to true. And if we push the large files, we of course need to tell Git where to push these large files to. So we need to add a Git remote. And then Git LFS goes off and, um, or Git P4 goes off and makes the migration. It will automatically generate the proper Git attributes file to tell Git which files are stored in LFS. However, as I said, we have repositories that have 20 years of history and they contain a lot of files. And so what file extensions should, should I pick? Unfortunately, just defining the file extensions, that did not work well for me. So I added another option, and it's called large file compressed threshold. So what do I mean by that? With this option, Git P4 will take a file from Perforce, will compress it, and then it will um, check if the, if the compressed size of the file is larger than this given threshold, then it will store the file in Git LFS. And I found that 200K is a pretty good indicator um, for large files for, for me. Because, I mean, imagine if you have um, a source code file and, and you compress it and it's still 200K, then it's a pretty big source code file. So it's probably something um, that should not be stored in Git. And of course, when you use that option, Git before will generate the proper Git attributes file and, will, and you get, um, Git repository will just work with LFS. Um, this is a pretty big patch to Git P4, and it was discussed for a long time on a Git mailing list. But just last week, uh, you know, wrote an email that um, it's scheduled for the next branch, so it will hopefully be part of Git 2.7. Let's see. Okay, the next topic, too many files. There's a famous quote from Linus Torvalds, the inventor of Git, and he wrote, Git fundamentally never really looks at less than a root repository. So what does he mean like, by that? Well, when you have a Git repository uh, with a working directory of like 100,000 files, then Git will pretty much, for most of the operations, it will look at these files and at each one of them. So if you have a lot of files in your Git repository, then your Git operations tend to get slow. And a lot of files is really 
like 100,000 is a lot of files. So 100,000 files still works, a million files, not so much. So what can you do about that? First and foremost, you can exclude undesired files. Let's assume, yeah, I mean, we all are big fans of the Octocats, so at some point in the past, we added all our favorite Octocat pictures to the repositories. That's great, but the Octocats, they are not really part of the project. You can build, test, and run the product without the Octocats, so you might not want to have them in your final Git repository. So you should exclude them. And again, how can you exclude them? With the Perforce client spec. In a client spec, you can define directories, files, or arbitrary patterns, um, and you add a, a dash in front of them, and that will exclude them in the resulting Git repository. If you do this, you will speed up your Git operations, and of course, you will reduce the time to clone and fetch your resulting Git repository. And your developers will like that. But sometimes, this is not enough. Your Git repository is still too big. So what can you do about that? Well, you can move your third-party code out of the Git repository. That might sound obvious to you, but Perforce is used in a different way, at least in our company. Many of our teams, they put all the stuff of a, of a certain project into the Perforce repository. So all third-party code, all dependencies, everything. And what we recommend to them is, first of all, use, a na use the native package manager of your environment. So if you use Node, use NPM for packages. If you use Python, use pip, and so on and so forth. We actually run an artifactory instance within our corporate network to that supports all these different formats and where we can um, get these packages from. But some programming languages, for instance, C++, don't have a package manager, and we use a lot of C++. And in this case, we recommend to use Git submodules. And this is especially true if you don't, if you want to compile the stuff um, in the submodule uh, every time then a submodule is a very good idea and it works great for us. Although one word of advice, we do not recommend to nest submodules because that gets complicated very quickly. So you should always have only one level of submodules. But of course, sometimes we have third party components that have large binaries and we don't want to have these large binaries in our Git submodules. So we use Artifactory again. We zip them up into a package and upload them to the corporate Artifactory server, and then we set up our build and dependency scripts to download them whenever they are needed, and that works great for us. Unfortunately, even with both of these um, tricks or uh, both of the advices, it's not enough. Our repositories are still too big. So what can you do? Well, you can extract components. If you have a project that has more than 100,000 files, chances are that you can find a subcomponent in, this, in these 100,000 files. However, this refactoring is usually pretty hard. And some, uh, oftentimes, the development teams don't have the resources to do these extensive refactorings. And if you refactor and you take out um, a part of the source code, then um, I really want to, yeah, and it's super important that you, that you uh, make sure that you have independent components that do not share the same pace of development. So what do I mean that, by that? Well, consider source code and tests. You always want to have these two components in one repository. You don't want to split them because Whenever you change something in the source code, it's very likely that you will change something in the, in the test as well. And you don't want your developers to make two commits for one change. This will make it hard to track the change and it will annoy your developers. So don't, don't do that. Okay. 
so again, the large files um, or the, the, the big number of files um, is, is a known problem in the Git community. And many people try to solve that. And here's another idea how to solve that. Um, it's called Watchman. Watchman is a daemon to monitor file system changes that was developed by Facebook. They use Watchman to make their source control system mercurial scale. So how is this useful? Well, by default, Git asks the file system for changes. Imagine you have 100,000 files, then Git asks 100,000 questions, and that can take some time. With Watchman, the file system actually tells Git what has changed. As you can imagine, that can be a little bit faster. And David Turner from Twitter actually wrote a proof of concept in Git of this system. And indeed, it was faster. Unfortunately, it's not like super, super faster. It's just faster. And um, he wasn't able to convince the, the Git maintainers yet to, to merge in um, this fix. But um, as far as I know, it's still actively developed, and I hope really that this will, um, this will be uh, a viable option in the future. Okay, so to sum that up, all these technical challenges that I just described, the biggest one is really the number of files. So if you migrate repositories from Perforce to Git or from any other, or from any other source control system to Git, this is really the thing that you should have an eye on. So reduce the number of files in your Git repository in order to make your developers happy. So much about the technical challenges. But how about the non-technical challenges? Well, as you all know, Git is a distributed version control system. And many of the engineers, or at least at, at our company, Many of the engineers haven't used distributed version control systems yet. They have used centralized version control systems and they are used to the concept in these centralized version control systems. It starts with these very simple things like hashes. What are these hashes? I mean, they are used to consecutive numbers to identify a certain version of their code. And now they get these weird hashes. And then there are things like the staging area. Perforce doesn't have something like that, so they're confused by that. And of course, since Git is distributed, they will pre um, pretty quickly they will get in touch with forks and remotes. And this will be weird. So uh, they, they learn that they can push their code to different uh, locations. Um, yeah, that's something that might be natural to you but it takes some time to wrap your heart around all these concepts. And of course, at some point, they run into a problem with Git, and then they use Stack Overflow, search the internet, and they will find a solution. And of course, this solution includes a Git rebase, and you know where this will go to. And all these new concepts in Git, they enable the developers to follow new workflows. A very prime, uh, prime example is really feature branches. In other source control systems like Perforce, it's not really possible to have feature branches because setting up a branch is such a, such a big amount of work. And, um, and for that reason, the developers have never thought of using a branch for every single feature or for every single bug fix they do. So again, they need to wrap their head around. And of course, pull requests are an awesome workflow too. Our developers, or Perforce developers, they are used to have write access if they want to change something in some other team's code. With pull requests, they don't need direct write access. But it takes some time to, to understand these workflows. And even if the people have grasped the concepts and they know the workflows, Git has a new user interface. And Actually, Git has many user interfaces. You can interact with Git on GitHub, with GitHub desktop app. You can act, interact with Git with Source3. And of course, you can act, interact with Git with the very powerful command line. And this is where I also got a little bit of pushback with the command line. So some of our developers, they just don't like to use the command line. And 
ask me, are we in the 80s again, or what? <laughs> to summarize that, all these challenges are adaptive challenges, and they are really, really hard. And um, we run into them, and you will run into them probably as well. So what did we do about that? Well, we tried to start a movement. First, we established a GitHub Experts team. It's a team of people who are GitHub enthusiasts, who know how to use Git, who know how to use GitHub, and who know, most importantly, how to, what, what are the right workflows and how to work with, with Git and GitHub in a very efficient way. Then we created a Q&A page in our company network that people can use to ask questions about Git and where they can get an answer within minutes. And of course, then we provide hands-on training for the first projects that migrate, and especially for the bigger projects. Because if you help, to be, if you help people to be more productive, then they will actually spread that knowledge. They will share it with other peers, and they will convince other peers for you. So we try to, grant, to create a Git fan base. Okay, so now I want to summarize my talk, and uh, here are the key points I really want you to take away from this talk. First of all, for migration from Perforce to Git, use Git P4, and use the latest version because it contains a lot of fixes that will make your migration easier. Second, use LFS for large files. It's really great. It works on all platform, platforms, and yeah, we, it's, it's awesome. Third, reduce the file, number of files in your Git repositories. This will make it, will make Git very, very um, much faster and therefore your developers much more happy. And last but not least, start a movement. Take your developers and help them to solve their problems with Git. Show them how they can be more productive with Git. And if you get that across, then the Git virus will spread itself. And thanks for listening. That was the talk, and yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, sorry, I did not understand. Why we pick Git instead of Perforce? Okay, um, there are many reasons. Um, let me start with a very obvious one. I mean, if you, if you go to any university, what do the people use? They use Git. And no one, at least not at Malmö University, use Perforce. So um, it's a, and, and the, the people use Git and they want to use Git. So it's an advantage to get talent. I mean, many of my friends, they would say, okay, if, if the shop uses Perforce, I don't want to use Perforce, so they don't start at a certain, um, certain company. So I believe Git is really, um, the new workforce demands um, tools like Git, and they want to use them, and yeah. That's why we pick Git. Any other questions, yeah? We have many, many Perforce servers. Uh, I don't know how many, but quite a few. And we, right now we use one GitHub Enterprise instance, but a really, really big one. So, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. You got the question? I should have repeated that. Yeah. Okay. Question was how long uh, did the migration take? So. Right now, it's ongoing, and we established some processes to, to make a migration really easy, so it, 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 yeah. Right now, it's a matter of days, really. Um, the main thing is the restructuring of the repository, so we need to work with the teams to, to uh, move their third-party components into the appropriate places, and that is, that is what takes, that's, that's the thing that takes the longest, and um, when they have done that, then running Git before is really a thing that takes a couple of hours, and then 
then you're done. But what we usually do, at least right now, is that we, um, we migrate the repositories to Git, and then we have a cron job that updates these repositories every night so that the teams have, they, they continue to work in Perforce, but they have the Git repositories with the updated source code um, there every day. And we do this so that they can play with Git, they can try their workflows, and um, so that they can report problems early on. Because, yeah, we, I mean, we want to make our developers more productive, and you don't want to um, get into their way doing their work, right? And as soon as they tell us, okay, we are comfortable with the Git workflows and everything works as, as expected, then we, we pull the switch and put Perforce into read-only mode and they go and use Git. Okay. Any more questions or? I guess that's it. Thank you.